We're in week two of our It Starts in the Heart series. I know we already said it, but you can go back, check out the Hope on Demand through our YouTube channel. Check out week one. If you missed it, I want to encourage you to go back. Uh, I touched on a few things specifically about compassion, and I believe that God wants to get our attention more than ever as we finish out this year strong and uh, in Jesus' name, uh, move into the greatest years of our lives. That's what we believe. Our anchor verse for week two of It Starts in the Heart is found in Psalms 5110. I love this verse. It says, create in me a clean heart. Come on, somebody say a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. One more time. Create in me a clean heart. Other translations say a pure heart, O God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. The definition of the word steadfast on the screens is firmly fixed in place, immovable, unwavering. How many of y'all want a heart like that? that isn't moved by all the stuff happening in life. Now, we have a human heart, and God very much understands the humanity side of us, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. The title of week two of It Starts in the Heart is, It's Time for a Heart Check. Some of y'all are like, that's confirmation. I need to go to the cardiologist. We're talking spiritually, but it's time for a heart check. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, that you give me the right words to speak. It is not with my enticing words. Even my perfect oratory delivery, like Paul says, I need the demonstration more than ever, the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Speak through me today, but more importantly, God, speak through your word that does not return to you void. There are people, God, that need a word from you today, including me. So God, let us walk out better than when we came in. If that's you, shout amen if you receive it. So there's a question that's asked a lot with skeptics, or even agnostics, or maybe you're just new to the faith and you're curious, but there's a question that says, why does Christianity put so much emphasis on the human heart? Because it's just a muscle, right? The reality is the heart is not just an organ, but it's actually the spiritual center of our being. Everything we do, our words, our actions, our decisions flow from what's stored in our hearts. Our series verse is a verse that if you're a student of the Bible, you know this, Proverbs chapter 4 Verse 23, above all else, y'all know this verse, guard your heart. Why? Say it out loud. For everything you do flows from it. That's how you treat people. That is where compassion is. That's where passion for the things of Christ dwells. That's where the Spirit of God, the presence of the Almighty God, the New Testament describes the heart as the dwelling place of Christ. It also describes the heart as the seat of our conscience, the seat of emotion and belief. The heart is where God is revealed. The heart is where God's presence is ultimately revealed, where we can find rest, where we can find courage, where we can find peace, and we can find healing. This is why it's so essential to live a life out of a posture of a surrendered heart. So at the end of every service, we are not a church that believes all gods lead back to one God. And we'll be out in the lobby in between services if you ever want to just have a conversation or question about that. We believe, according to the word, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, that's a good place to shout right there. That's what we believe, that he's the only way to the Father, that eternity rests in our salvation and connection to Jesus. That's why at the end of every service, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, I will ask two questions. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time, or you want to rededicate your life. I give those two opportunities at the end of every service. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. That's where authentic and genuine transformation begins to happen in our lives. A transformed heart results in new desires, a better attitude. Don't look at the person next to you. Something like her. <laughs> A heart of thanksgiving, it shifts our behaviors ultimately to honor God. Ezekiel 36, 26 phrases it this way. And this is the Lord's words over us. And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. And I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. Come on, how many of y'all say, I need a little bit of that. Come on. A responsive heart. A responsive heart. Because y'all, the heart is consistently and constantly under attack from the world's temptations to the distractions of life. But when we allow Christ to transform our hearts, 
we end up experiencing strength and peace as we guard our hearts. Things like fear and doubt and shame and sin begin to fall away. And daily, our job as a Christian, which means Christ-like, is to daily put, position our lives under the mighty hand of God. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. As we do this, what ends up happening is it's posturing ourselves to choose to guard our hearts, to choose to protect our hearts. We talk to our kids all the time. Hey, guard your heart. She ain't that pretty. Hello? Guard your heart. He don't smell that nice. <laughs> guard your heart. Don't get lost in them icy blue eyes. Guard your heart. Because what you allow in your heart today, watch this, will reflect out of your heart tomorrow. Good or bad seeds. What you allow in, that's why it's so important. Guard your heart. Elbow the person next to you and say, I had a feeling that was for you. I just have a feeling. It's just the way I think whenever I'm putting my messages together and I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking. I said, it's so wild how so many Christians don't get this, but back in the day, the Backstreet Boys got it. You know that song, quit playing games with my heart. Come on, sing it. With my heart. Oh, six of you know it. With. And then the next line, I should have known from the start. Like, girl, get behind me, devil. <laughs> Satan, he ain't that smooth. Even the Backstreet Boys said, quit playing games. I should have known from the start. Here's the truth. The Holy Spirit is always speaking. How many of y'all would wave at me and just be honest? We're a transparent church across every campus. Be like, hey, there were some seasons I didn't guard my heart. I should have known from the start, Backstreet Boys. Amen. <laughs> no, but we have to guard our hearts. And then what happens is, well, how do we do that practically? Well, practically, we start by applying practical and intentional steps by checking our circle. Who's in your life? Who's the loudest voices in your life? Checking and looking at the company you keep, the things that you're allowing in. We have to set boundaries in place. We have to sharpen through the word and the presence of God our discernment. Because again, the Holy Spirit's always speaking like, mm -mm, I'm working on her, but you don't need to be the one that's ministering to her. Let me help. No, no. We have to sharpen our discernment. We have to seek out relationships that hold us accountable. Pastor Jackie and I in the lobby every week, we're encouraging you, get in a group. Make some noise if you're in the freedom groups right now. Come on, make some noise. Get in a group. Don't do life alone. We're better together. These are all the phrases we use because we believe, I have my own Bible study. Like, we're not just talking about it, we live it out. Make some noise, man camp, if you're in the room. We just have man camp. Listen, we just had man camp. It was unbelievable. Gentlemen, if you missed it, mark it on your calendars next year when we release these dates. It was phenomenal with an F. Phenomenal. I know it's PH. I know it's PH. Okay. It was awesome. Here's the promise, though. Here's the promise we can hold on to when we apply these practical steps, boundaries, accountability, sharpening our discernment. Here's the promise when we apply it. Philippians 4, 7, or if you're new to the Bible, the book of Philippines. Then you will experience God's peace. These dad jokes are just happening today. <laughs> then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. I love that. His peace will guard your, here's the word. This is what we're talking about this whole series. It will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This week, and honestly this entire month, because this is Thanksgiving month, this is November, we're gonna have an attitude of gratitude. Come on, somebody. Attitude, look at the person next to you and say, it's time for you to have an attitude of gratitude. And then look at your second choice and say, I can see it in your eyes. You definitely need this. I can see it. But this week, and honestly this entire month, we're gonna be talking about gratitude. And let me ask this question though. What are you filling your life up with and your heart up with daily? Are you filling it with God's word? Because again, what fills spills, or are you being overwhelmed and distracted by life's distractions and you're like, it's hard for me to even process because I'm consumed with so many other things. This month, we're teaching our kids this, that attitude of gratitude. We're talking more about moving in compassion, seeing others, getting the attention off ourselves. And last week, I talked about how Jesus five different times in the New Testament, had this line. It said this, he was moved with compassion. If you missed it again, go back. But this weekend, I want to talk about compassion and something else that runs parallel 
with compassion, and that's generosity. Compassion and generosity and how they run parallel and how it really does start in the heart. Last week, I talked about how our family, and I just said, this is our cadence. This is our rhythm. We budget in blessing people every month. It doesn't even have to be a great deal of money. It does have to be a posture of your heart that says, God, I'm making room. And I'm telling you, if you'll make room for God to use your life and choose your life to move and help somebody else, he will give you opportunities. But it's up to you to say yes or no. So last week, Monday, my wife warned me on the drive home. Because, y'all, we had a huge week. We had the W night. Make some noise. W night. It was unreal. This room was slam-packed. Like, it was phenomenal. Incredible night. And then I preached all weekend. So Mondays are typically our family <sighs> breather day because we work all weekend. And it's, uh, it's busy and it's incredible. But I was exhausted. And she's like, guess what? And guess what? <laughs> she doesn't talk like that. But <laughs> And I said, well, she's like, tomorrow starts our Christmas journey as a family. <laughs> now, how many of y'all would say it's too early? It's too early. Okay, we're all the Hallmark Christmas people are like, it's too late. It's too late. We should have started in September to remember. <laughs> but she's like, we're going to go on this journey, all of us. And I'm like, what? I would have rather in that moment have had a root canal than do all that. Because <laughs> I knew we were going to go to multiple stores. I was going to have to be like, oh, yeah, that's incredible. It just keeps getting more expensive and better every year. <laughs> She's like, we're going to transform our whole house into a Christmas wonderland. And I'm like, yeah, on a Dollar Tree budget. <laughs> like, you have $19. What are we going to do with this? So she's like, how about we go to First Watch first? And I'm like, well, don't threaten me with a good time. So we went to breakfast. She totally duped me. And we had a great time, of course. But we went to this one store. And uh, it was like 10, 15 in the morning. And uh, it was only self-checkout lanes. And there was like 40 people in line. And they're getting worked up like, was nobody working here? And the guy's standing there and he's like, uh, there's only one lady on the register and she took her lunch break. I'm like, it's 10.08. I can see why. <laughs> I understand. You guys have been open an hour. She needed a sandwich already. She's like, it's 10. It's lunchtime. So she left. We didn't even know if she might have quit. We don't even know. She never came back. We were there a long time. But I was feeling the intensity and the tension from people. And there was this guy that was in the checkout lane, and it's 10 items or less. We had like 40 items. Everybody did because we were, well, there was nobody there. And so this one guy is having a tough time, and nothing is scanning, and he's, he's looking around, and people are like, come on, man. Welcome to the 21st century. Come on, scan it. Like, and I'm standing there like, ah. my kids are looking at me. Everybody's like, so I walk over to him. I say, hey, can I help you out? And he's like, ah, super embarrassing. I, I don't know why I can't get this to scan. And so I, I, beep, I helped him. And I said, what else you got? And said, okay, got it. And I said, is that it? He said, yeah, that's it. I said, no, nah, come on, man. This is on me. Get something else. He's like, what do you mean? I said, grab a bag of jerky. He's like, okay. I said, get this chapstick. Why, you, why would you do that? This guy was having a tough time, and you could tell he'd had a pretty rough, rough journey, and everybody's, yeah, everybody's upset. And I ended up blessing $8.84. The look on his face was so grateful. He was so thankful. And he left, and people were looking at me like, hey, yeah, that was awesome. Good job. Thanks for that. Appreciate you, you know what meant the world to me was my kids. My oldest two saying, hey, that was awesome. Thanks, Dad, for practicing what you preach. You talk about Jesus' life, how he was moved with compassion. And we just saw you moved with compassion. I'm not bragging on me. I'm just open-handed. God, here's my yes every single day. $8.84? That wasn't that much. He, it could have been $884. And I'm like, all right, amen. Well, that's how you scan. That is how you scan. <laughs> I'm going to go back over here. Touch a tutorial on scanning. Oof. Compassion and generosity isn't about wealth or even somebody who has significant resources. It really is the condition of the heart. My kids were like, when we grow up, Dad, we want to be able to do that one day. I said, you can do that right now. Go pay for whatever mom's buying. And they were like, um, <laughs> I don't think we can do that. But the more you allow God, I said this a moment ago, the more you allow God to move through your life, he'll refill you up with greater compassion. He'll bless you to be a blessing. He'll give you more increase and a greater love for people. Jesus himself said in Luke 6, 45, I love this verse. He said, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. 
which means you have to have good things stored up in your heart to overflow with compassion. And when you allow God to really transform your life, and I'll say it again, generosity and compassion, it really does begin in the heart, but only if you will say yes, but only if you will allow God to equip and use your life. Again, it doesn't matter what the amount is. It's a moment where you just take a moment, smile at somebody, say, hey, whatever you're going through today, compassion has so many lanes that we can take as humanity. The problem is we're so consumed. I said this last week. I said we're so consumed focusing on our own grind set mindset. Like I got to get mine. I got to focus on me. To be honest, the humanity side of me was like, come on, man. Can't you see there's so many people in line? You can't figure out how to scan your items? But the truth is, I want to live my life in such a way that's moved with compassion. Compassion and generosity really become activated when we allow God to truly change our hearts. Say it out loud. Say, God, change my heart to see what you see. We end up giving out of obligation rather than compassion and love and obedience to what he asks if we rely on our human nature, because the human nature side of us says, I don't know, we approach all of it flippantly, we dismiss other people's needs while I have my own, we dismiss serve opportunities while I hope somebody goes and handles this hope for Christmas thing because I'm too busy, I hope somebody shows up and sets up these chairs because that's beneath me, I, I hope somebody gives towards that building because I'm sick of just showing up and meeting in a gym, so whose responsibility is all of it? All of us. Because if not us, then who? If not us, then who? I really, I really believe that. If not us, then, then who? And as God is, is pouring into our lives, we should be pouring back out. I want you to grab this. A changed heart, a really surrendered and changed heart becomes a transformed heart that ultimately recognizes this. Here's the great epiphany this weekend. We end up recognizing that everything air we breathe, the steps we take, your woo, your boo, your charisma, your creativity, all of it belongs to God. All of it belongs to God. Psalms 24, once so you don't think it's my opinion. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. Somebody say out loud, I'm, I'm, I'm one of his people. And when our hearts align with this truth, giving back, showing up, serving, showing up for others more than just yourself, becomes this natural act of compassion, obedience, and love towards others. There's a story in the book of Luke about a man named Zacchaeus. If you're student the Bible, you know about this dear brother Zacchaeus who encountered Jesus and experienced radical heart change, and it shifted his entire life. So for context, Zacchaeus was not respected. He was actually avoided. He was a loner, lived a pretty isolated life. He wasn't well-liked. Why? Because he was a tax collector, but he wasn't just a tax collector. He was a crooked tax collector. And so he had a pretty bad reputation. Luke 19, picking it up in verse one, it says this, Jesus entered Jericho, made his way through the town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. He'd become very rich. He became very rich ripping off people. Verse three. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for where Jesus was going to be passing by. When Jesus came by, you know, I preached last week that Jesus lived a life that could be interrupted. Jesus walked slow enough to be able to catch a little buddy up in a sycamore tree. <laughs> it says, it says, Jesus came by, looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be guest at your home today. Now, everybody, the Pharisees, the people who had been ripped off by this man, as Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his home with great excitement and joy. Watch this. The people, verse 7, were displeased. He's going to be with the notorious sinner? They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord at his home and said, I'll give away half my wealth to the poor. Lord, if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Watch this. Just the presence of Jesus, it, it, it unlocked conviction, a, a, a holy and righteous indignation to say, hey, if I, if I, and we all know he did, 
but if I did this, listen, Lord, I'm going to take care of the people that I cheated. Jesus responded, salvation has come to your home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. Now we would see this and say, but Jesus could have reached so many other people. Jesus was even moved with compassion with a pretty jacked up guy like Zacchaeus. Now if your name is Zacchaeus, we're not talking about you. We're talking about the little guy in the Bible. But Zacchaeus had a radical transformation, a radical heart change and began to live his life more with compassion and generosity himself. Because write this down, I'm taking down notes, a changed heart from God leads us to compassion and generosity. It leads you to a place of compassion and generosity where you start seeing people. Truth, truth be told, practicing what I preach, after preaching last Sunday, I, I was looking for more opportunities to just get in the way of people's storms. Looking for more opportunities to, to, to encourage my kids. No, no, no. Don't see their attitudes. See them the way Jesus sees them, which is difficult. D don't get distracted by the inconvenience of the God that doesn't know how to scan anything. Let's go out of our way and see what we can do to be a solution. Here's the promise. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. When you allow the Spirit of God to lead you to a place of compassion and generosity, you will be, I love this prophecy, you will be enriched in every way. Come on, somebody say amen, that's for me. So that you can be generous every once in a while. No, no, it says on every occasion. And through your generosity, it will result, what a perfect verse for the month of November, in thanksgiving to God. A true generosity, someone who's truly generous, recognizes it's not about the amount. Again, it's about the heart and spirit in which we give. There's another story in the book of Mark where Jesus and his disciples encountered a widow woman. And I love the way this unfolds in the teaching from Jesus and what we can learn from it. Mark 12, verse 41 through 44, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple. Not to peek in and be like, that's not enough. Is that all you're going to give? That's not what it said. He watched the crowds as they dropped in their money. What was he doing? He was, he was watching their hearts. Many rich people put large amounts in. Then a poor widow came and dropped two small coins. Who's ever heard of the phrase, the widow's mites? So these two coins would, in, in modern text for us to this day, these two coins would have added up to barely a penny. It's funny, in our, in our humanity now, we're like, I'm not even going to bend down and pick up that old penny. If I touch it, I might get pink eye. Just leave it there. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So this poor widow woman drops these two small coins. Jesus calls to his disciples. He was always teaching them. And he said, I tell you the truth. The poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. You know, they were puzzled like, yeah, but God, this guy just dropped a lot of money. This guy's helping us reach a lot of people. And watch it. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she... As poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Because again, y'all, and this is, what, this is the takeaway for us, true generosity often requires sacrifice. The sacrificial side of us, it's not convenient for me to show up, but I'm gonna show up. It's not convenient for me to serve, but I'm gonna get off the sidelines and go through HC Connect and serve. It's not convenient for me to go wrap presents and help those in need, and 10,000 plus families get toys, but I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone, get off of my Netflix and sit season and go help and serve and show up for others. True generosity, whether it's your time, your talent, your giving, often requires sacrifice. It's not about giving what's easy or doing what's easy, but offering something meaningful. For the widow that Jesus talked about, this was a sacrificial gift, an offering of these two might. Sacrificial giving deepens our trust in God and what it does is it constantly aligns our hearts back to his heart. When you show up and you serve and bless others, it aligns your heart back to God's. The Bible talks about how it's better to give than it is to receive. People always think that's like money. <laughs> it could just be you showing up and being there for somebody else. Showing up and serving and giving. And Some of y'all have been withholding your gifts because you think they belong to you. Some of you should be right up here. You should have already joined the team. You should already be serving and creative. 
Some of y'all have a hospitality gift, but you're like, I don't know. Seems like they have other people doing it. But the misconception is these gifts are your gifts. They're not yours. They're from God to you to be a blessing and to give them away, to constantly serve others. A heart shaped by sacrifice mirrors God's own generosity. A heart shaped by sacrifice mirrors God's own generosity. What does that mean? Well, we see it through the gift of Jesus. We're going to be at the Texans game a little bit later. Go Texans. Come on, somebody. So much better than the Cowboys. Um, it's really shocking. We'll be at the Texans game later, and every time we're at a game, somebody is holding that sign. John 3, 16, it says this. Throw it up on the screen. This is what it says. For this is how God loved the world. What did he do? He, he gave. He modeled it right from the start. He gave. Not his second or third best. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish. That's good news. And we'll have eternal life. Come on, somebody say, thank you for giving us Jesus. Our giving, our generosity, even our compassion for others begins to really align with the heart of God when we understand how much God has already given us. He gave us life. He gave us provision. He ultimately gave us Jesus. Paul writes this sobering heart check verse in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now that does not mean an escalade. <laughs> give us all things. That's the peace you need, y'all. Give us all things. That's that joy that you need to become your strength. Give us all things. That's that fight and that perseverance, that creativity, that discernment. Why would he withhold any of that from us as his kids? as he gave up and showed that he gave his own son. When we understand the magnitude of God's gift in Christ, our hearts should be moved towards becoming more like Jesus every day. I'm far from it, but boy, every day, I want to just get a little bit closer to looking like Jesus. Some of y'all are well, you got to grow hair first. You don't know really what Jesus looked like. <laughs> when we grasp this kind of generosity that God himself poured out upon all of us, we recognize that broken humanity needs hope, and is the hope of the world is Jesus. He has a name. Hope has a name, and it's Jesus, but the hope to this world is the local church, and that's, that's all of us, y'all. We make up the body of Christ. Yeah, but Pastor Daniel, I limped in here. I myself am broken humanity. One of the most beautiful things about going from nothing to something is helping people go from broken to breakthrough because you yourself are being transformed. You yourself are being healed. You, you're, you can't take somebody to a place you aren't yourself, but you can say, hey, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm further than I used to be. Let me extend my hand and help you up because somebody helped me up in the local church. When we grasp this kind of generosity, it will move us like it did Zacchaeus to be the kind of people that are more compassionate, more understanding, and overall more generous. Our hearts should be moved towards that kind of willingness every day. What does that look like? It looks like an open-handed life. It looks like whatever you're asking of me, the answer, oh God, is yes. And this is with my time. This is with my gifts. This, was, this is with my resources. Because again, generosity and compassion, reiterating, it really does start in the hearts, but it's rooted in gratitude. It's rooted in gratitude. It's sustained by trusting God and ultimately modeled after God's character, which by the way, God's character, we can count on. The promises of God, we can count on. I preached this for years. They don't have expiration dates on them. God's character doesn't have expiration dates on it. You can count on his promises when you lean on them. Other people, yeah, they typically, they typically will fail you. The government is not our source that we count on. You know who we count on? We count on God every single time because he's trustworthy, because he's consistent, because he's shown up time and time again. I feel like somebody should shout, God, I can count on you. Say it again, God, I can count on you. I can count on you. So just like a changed heart leads us to compassion and generosity, number two, write this one down. A joy-filled heart from God inspires compassion and generosity. When we live with open hands, you'll begin to look for opportunities 
to bless others, to serve others, to share the same joy and love you've received from Jesus to others. Generosity rooted in the heart produces a joy-filled heart. It produces a joy-filled heart. That's where those roots go down deep in the soil of his presence. And then you're like, man, now the overflow, I just, I want to start seeing others. Because ultimately somebody, somebody along the journey has seen you. And let me say this, don't ever let the enemy convince you that you aren't blessed. There's always something that we can be grateful for. Yeah, like what? Was your breathing? Let's just start there. You showed up. You, got, you can have free coffee. You got to buy the other one, but the drip coffee, it's free. Amen. <laughs> Generosity rooted in the heart produces a joy-filled heart. And it's not just a gift for the recipient, but also to the giver. Let me encourage you. In the Bible, 2 Corinthians talks about how God loves a cheerful giver. It's not real big. Loves a cheerful giver. Some of y'all haven't smiled in a while. You're like, oh. Some of you are like, I don't want to get laugh lines. Smile. Come on. Isn't it David Beckham's wife who doesn't smile because she doesn't want to get laugh lines? I'm like, mm-mm, that ain't me. I want, to have, I want to have lots of laugh lines. I want people to be like, this guy's happy. Look at the person next to you and say, smile. Smile real big. Come on, like Joel Osteen, just real big. It makes you feel better. God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't love a stingy, there you go, I put something in God. He doesn't like that attitude. And listen, Hope City will never be a church where you feel manipulated, arm twisted. Even our generosity moment, it's an act of worship. Pastor Rock didn't come out here and be like, this section over here is the $5,000 section. People are like, let me get up. It was the $85 section. No, you'll never be manipulated or twisting of an arm, but there will be sincere intentionality that says, hey, y'all, whether it's the widow's might or something that looks like a lot more, the truth is when we all together sow something, we all together can reach a lot more people and do some major damage to the kingdom of darkness. There's a little over 12,000 people that call Hope City home. What kind of territory can we take? What kind of territory can we take if we all did something? What kind of reputation would we have if we all were known as the compassionate church? Oh, listen, if you got an issue, trust me, that Hope City acts like the early church. Man, they'll show up. They'll help you scan items. (laughs) They'll show up and be there for you. They'll show up there and be in your corner. They'll help you up out of the ditch. A church that looks compassionate church that is full of a generous spirit. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. This is what it says. Now remember, this is he who sows sparingly. Okay, yeah, yeah. I messed up. Now remember this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to others, will also reap generously and be blessed. Let each one give, Pastor Rock said this, thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart. But that's also from what the Lord has spoken to you, not grudgingly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one, here's the line, whose, say it out loud, whose heart is in it. All of it. He was moved with compassion, heart. A generous moment, I wanna sow into this, I wanna give to this, I wanna bring my tithe in and give to missions, heart. I I wanna serve and show up, heart. I want to look somebody in the eyes and let them know they can make it, that their best days are not behind them. Heart. When we understand that giving is a privilege and compassion is a gift, our hearts will be moved with joy. It's a joy. It's a joy. Pastor Brandon exudes this. Our missions team exudes this. It's a joy to serve others. It's a joy to show up in someone's low season and help lift them up. It's a joy to advance God's mission. So I'm gonna plug it, because he's not up here. I'm gonna plug Hope for Christmas. Right here, you can scan this QR code, hopecity.com slash HFC. On December 14th, we're going to be serving thousands and thousands and thousands of families. Well, what is it? Uh, folks come that, 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 that go through the process, and they come in, and we set this thing up like a, like a store. 
And they get to walk around and they get to shop for their kids in the appropriate age, female or male. And then our team, our amazing dream team, make some noise for the dream team. Our dream team is they're wrapping these presents up and giving it to these moms and these dads. We, we preach the gospel. We tell them about the good news of Jesus. So then these moms, with all of their dignity, can go home with these gifts, put them under their own tree, and the kids can open them. We're going to give away close to 10,000 toys, and we would love for y'all to be a part. Scan the QR code for more information. Well, why do we do things like this? I mean, isn't there enough things to be done? We do this, number three, because a surrendered heart to God leads us to love what he loves. A surrendered heart to God leads us to love what he loves. Well, what does he love? He loves people. He loves people. People matter to God, so they matter to, to us. This is where the church shows up and responds. When I say the church, I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about buildings. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Our mission is to help people find hope through the love of Jesus. So it takes all of us being moved with compassion. It takes all of us getting a heart of becoming generous people. It takes all of us a unified people. I love the diversity of our church because this is what heaven's going to look like. A unified church is a dangerous church to the enemy's camp. A dangerous church to what the devil has planned. A unified church that really recognizes that people really do matter to God. That's who we are at Hoop City. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. This was my anchor verse last week. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. At the end of every year, on December 8th specifically, we do a thing called Hope for the House. Hope for Christmas is our mission's reach. Hope for the House is our end of year campaign so that we can finish the year strong budget wise and also fulfill all of our commitments, our word to all of our initi initi initiatives. We've got missions organizations that we've committed to and, and people to reach every single week. And so 30 to 35% of a nonprofit and church's income for the entire year comes in in November and December. Isn't that crazy? 30 to 35%. So a lot of our folks will do an end of year moment. And this is my ask. And this is our prayer. I can sp speak on behalf of my beautiful wife and our entire leadership team. We're believing for 100% participation, even if it's the widow's might. Our Hope for the House offering, you can scan this QR code, is going to be happening on December 8th. Well, where's the money going to be going? It's going to be finishing this year strong. It's going to set us up with all the vision and all the things that we're about to step into in 2025. The last weekend of January is our 10-year anniversary as a church. And y'all, it's going to be amazing. We're going to talk about and celebrate all that God's done because we've shined pretty bright in the city, but we know over the next 10, 15 years, we're going to shine even brighter and it's going to be absolutely incredible. So how we finish strong, part of our Hope for the House initiative is that we're believing that every single one, here's our prayer. You don't have to give anything today, but here's our prayer that every single person would pray, God, what would you have me give in this end of year initiative to help more people find hope, to help reach more people, whether it's new campuses or continuing to fulfill the campuses we have, whether it's all of our outreaches, local, national, and global, what would you have me do, whether it's a widow's mite or something larger, it's all significant in the hands of God. So December 8th, we're going to be doing that. Now look at me real quick. The humanity side says, all right, make a note. December 8th, I'm not going to go that weekend. Because you don't even know I might change up the date on you. Amen. <laughs> you do have until December 31st to get it in by the end of the year for anybody who would like to talk about that for tax purposes. But hope for the house is a big deal for all of us. What would a united, generous, compassionate church look like? It would look like this. It would look like heaven. It would look like the diversity of God's creation, created man and woman in the beautiful culture of his image. And we've got a lot of work to do, and we've got a lot of people to reach. We've got a pretty broken city. We're number one in most diversity. We're number one in most di diverse food, amen. But we're also number one in murders. 
We're also really high in trafficking. There's a lot of darkness and evil and brokenness in our city. And it's time for the church to rise up and shine even brighter. I feel it. I feel it so strong as we finish out this year. As we finish this year strong, we, we start 2025 20, off stronger. And again, we are a church moved by compassion. You can stand to your feet. We're a church moved by compassion. We love people. We romance people to Jesus. We're going to build campuses. We're going to plant additional campuses. We're going to continue to help people find hope. We're going to do whatever it takes to reach people far from God and let them know that God is not mad at them, but he's madly in love with them. Would you lift your hands towards heaven and just close your eyes for just a moment? God, we thank you that you were moved with compassion. And we want to be like you. We want to be new. We want to be just like you. So Jesus, this is my prayer today that we would lay down any religious ideology. We would lay down any of the, well, every church just wants our money. Y'all, I'll be really transparent. It's not about getting something from any of us. It's about God getting something to us and through us. I'll say this. We don't need your money. But God's work to go into all this city, nation, and world, it takes resources to do what God wants to do in this city, nation, and world. But even beyond that, he's looking for compassion that will show up and serve their time, their talent, and their giving. I want to take just two moments. I ask the team to come back out. And I want to read, go back through this new wine moment because Jesus took new wine and poured it. He couldn't pour it into old wineskins because it would burst. So God, make us new today so that you can pour out a freshness in our lives, a fresh fire in our lives, a generous spirit in our lives, a, a heart ready to reach people and do whatever it takes. Even if you can't sing on key, come on, every campus, come on. We want to be new. I want to be just like you. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. I want to be, I want to be new. I want to be just like you. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Make me. Cause I came here with nothing. All you have given me. Jesus, bring you wine. I wanna be new. I wanna be new. I wanna be just like you. Jesus, bring new wine. I wanna be. Wanna be new? Wanna be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, come on! If you receive something today, can you just give Him praise? Come on, give Him praise for the reading of His Word. I said it up top. The reason we do all of this is because there are people that need hope. There are people that need Jesus, need a Savior. So everybody looking at me across every campus, even those tuning in online, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you want to, this is the first of two invitations today. Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. I want to align my heart to His heart so I can ultimately look like Him. Because the way I've been living is not working, and I feel this void in my life that I've been filling with so many other things. But today, I want to surrender my life to Jesus for the very first time. Again, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. We will 
be saved. He'll write victory in your story. Or you're the second invitation. You say, Pastor Daniel, I used to be compassionate. I would have helped the guy with the beep. <laughs> I would have helped the scan, scan guy at the store. I would have been more compassionate. I, I used to be generous. I used to want to serve. I used to have a heart for his house, but I, I got caught up in the prodigal life. Life is lifing and it caught me off guard and it's sucker punched me. But today I want to rededicate my life, realign my heart to his heart, and commit my life to his so I can look like him. I want to be new. I want to be just like him. Now with every eye closed, just for a moment, Pastor Daniel, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time or two. I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you and you, you and you and you and you and you. I see you. I see you over there. I saw you in the back. Amazing. Amazing. Come on, Hope City. One more time. That was just at West Houston. I saw you. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, it's me. Here's all my stuff. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my shame. Here's all my issues. I'm laying them at your feet and I'm asking for forgiveness. I repent for all of it. And I'm grateful that Jesus hung on that cross, gave up his life for mine so that I could live a life that looks like him. Got up out of the grave on the third day so that I could experience freedom and hope. And today I'm grateful for that promise. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise? Now come on, praise Him. That was awesome.